Hi again, everyone. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief reflection on the Emmaus Road journey, which and some of the themes that come out of that for me, which I hope will be useful for you as you embark on this journey into a new landscape for your diocese. So let me begin with the reading. It's Luke chapter 30, uh, 24, verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. So I'm going to share my screen now and um, we'll embark on a brief Bible study around the Emmaus Road. And I've entitled this Three Mile an Hour God. And uh, these are the themes that we'll be considering very briefly. Attentiveness, the speed of love and woundedness. Hospitality, the gift of sight, and who sees Jesus, and we'll finish with joy. So, attentiveness. We read of these two disciples going to a village about seven miles from Jerusalem, miserable and downcast after the events of the last few days. They know what has happened that very morning, that Jesus' body has gone from the tomb. They have this news from the women. We know that they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense, it tells us in verse 11. Perhaps this was their first mistake, not believing the women. And so here they are, two companions, perhaps having left the rest of the disciples to walk back, <coughs> to walk back, and then they come across Jesus who invites them to tell their story. He neither interrupts nor corrects them. He listens to their story until the end. And they stop and they freely respond, they respond freely and openly to Jesus' question. They include him in their confusion and pain. They told him about the women, about the empty tomb, about what had happened to Jesus. So I think that's a lesson for us, and it makes me wonder, do we allow people to tell their stories uninterrupted? 
do we offer to those in our communities that precious gift of attentive listening? And then Jesus responds very directly to them and rebukes them. He puts their story within the wider context of the story told within the scriptures and later on in reflection, and later on in reflection in these moments, the disciples would acknowledge the rekindling of hope as their hearts burned within them. I wonder how long this exposition took. Had they been walking a long time? How much time did Jesus take over this? There's a wonderful article that some of you may know by Japanese theologian Kasike Koyama called Three Mile an Hour God. And he says in that article, God walks slowly because God is love. If he's not love, God would have gone much faster. Love has its speed. It's an inner speed. It's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we're accustomed. It's slow, yet it's lord over all other speeds, since it's the speed of love. It goes on in the depth of our life, whether we notice or not, whether we're currently hit by a storm or not, at three miles an hour. It's the speed we walk, and therefore it is the speed the love of God walks. I love to think of Jesus walking along the road with Cleopas and his friend at three miles an hour at the speed of love. At the speed of love, he unfolded the scriptures to them as he accompanied them with his presence. The God of love who walks alongside us at human speed, patiently explained and elaborated what perhaps should have been obvious. But isn't this a beautiful picture of how God deals with us, walking alongside us, at the speed of love. But as they're travelling along this road, I also think of Jesus' wounds. Because on this journey along the Maus Road, it's, it's the resurrected Jesus who encounters them, who still bears the marks of the cross on his body. I wonder, did these two not see the marks on his hands as he explained the scriptures to them? I imagine that he was probably gesticulating and perhaps throwing his arms around, did they not notice the wounds, the fresh scars? So thinking of Jesus' wounds reminds me of an interview that I read between Rowan Williams and New Zealander father Michael Lapsley, founder of the Institute for the Healing of Memories in Cape Town. Michael Lapsley lost both his hands and one eye as a result of a parcel bomb he received during the apartheid era. He reflects on his wounds after hearing the story of the restoration of St. Ethelberger's Centre for Reconciliation and Peace in London. The architects who restored that building after an IRA bomb had shattered it did not attempt to hide the past. In fact, they used some of the bricks salvaged from the rubble in the restoration, thereby ensuring that the scars of the past are still visible. Michael Lapsley commented, sorry, this is a, a very good picture, I think, on woundedness, the five marks of mission that really matter, the stigmata of Jesus. Michael Lapsley commented on this, that that too mirrors not only my own journey, but that of so many others, including Jesus himself, who asked the doubting disciple Thomas to thrust his hand into the wound in his side which, although no longer bleeding, was nevertheless still visible. So too our wounds may heal, but they often leave traces that remain throughout our lives. That's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it can be a good thing if it reminds us that suffering can be transformed into something that is life-giving. Now to hospitality. As we approach the climax of the story, Jesus makes as if to go on. He will not impose himself on them. But they, with customary Middle Eastern hospitality, invite him in. The Greek expression is strong, and they would not take no for an answer. They couldn't think of letting the stranger carry on as night is approaching, and so they invite him in for food and for shelter, for companionship, those most basic of human needs. Christine Pohl, in her book, Making Room, Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition, notes that hospitable places allow room for friendships to grow. 
Food, shelter and companionship are all interrelated in these settings. In such environments, weary and lonely persons can be restored to life. And is this not exactly what happens here? Our two downcast and weary disciples, having walked the road with Jesus, recognise him, not as they were walking and during the discussions, not while he was explaining the scriptures to them, even though they later say that their hearts were burning within them as Jesus talked to them on the road, but at the very moment of this meal. Of course, this has allusions to the Eucharist and the breaking of bread when we meet Jesus in a sacramental way. Have you ever noticed that eating together is a great leveler? It's something that we all must do, so it has a profoundly egalitarian dimension. In a unique moment in the book of Ephesians, we see Jews and Gentiles coming together. The test of their coming together was the meal table. The institution that once symbolised ethnic and cultural division now becomes a symbol of Christian living. The metaphor of seeing is very common in the book of Acts, the sequel to Luke. Stephen saw the glory of God and the Son of Man as he was being stoned. Peter saw a vision which eventuated in Cornelius and his family coming to know Christ and indeed changed Peter himself. The crowd saw, saw many miraculous signs. The people saw the crippled beggar from the temple beautiful praising God. Firstly, our eyes are opened to see Jesus, to see Jesus for who he is, our saviour, redeemer and friend. Our eyes are open to the reality of Christ and our eyes are open to the reality of the other. The gift of sight and insight is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Our eyes have to be open to recognise Jesus, just as it was for those first disciples over the dinner table, on the Emmaus Road, in the garden, on the lake, on the Damascus Road. And once we can see Jesus, the Holy Spirit enables us to see, to acknowledge, to recognise the other person. This is truly a gift of the Spirit. As Christine Paul says, hospitality resists boundaries that endanger persons by denying their humanness. It saves others from the invisibility that comes from social abandonment. Sometimes, by the very act of welcome, a vision for a whole society is offered, a small evidence that transformed relations are possible. Think of the Good Samaritan, who refused to pass by or pretend that he had not seen the wounded man. This act of hospitality crossed ethnic boundaries, caused him personal cost and inconvenience, and saved a life. When we see the other person, we see the image of God, as well as our common humanity, which establishes a fundamental dignity, respect, and common bond. The parable in Matthew 25 and the story on Emmaus Road, the Emmaus Road encounter, powerfully remind us that we can see Christ in every guest and stranger. And of course, these may be the very people who do see Jesus, those who are on the edge, on the margins, who know their brokenness, the invisible ones. Listen to uh, this wonderful poem that is paired with this Velasquez painting, poem by Denise Levitov, The Servant Girl at Emmaus. There she is, listening, attentive, on the edge, invisible. She listens, listens, holding her breath. Surely that voice is his, the one who had looked at her once across the crowd, as no one had ever looked, had seen her, had spoken as if to her. Surely those hands were his, taking the platter of bread from hers just now, hands he'd laid on the dying and made them well. Surely that face. The man they crucified for sedition and blasphemy, the man whose body disappeared from its tomb, the man it was rumoured now some women had seen this morning alive. Those who had brought the stranger home to their table don't recognise yet with whom they sit. 
but she, in the kitchen, absently touching the wine jug she's to take in, a young black servant intently listening, swings round and sees the light around him and is sure. She knew. She knew that he is the one. This is such a wonderful picture, both visually and verbally, of how God works. The little ones, the unexpected ones, the ones that we perhaps do not see, who see Jesus. So who is it that we do not see in our day, in our contexts, who can help us to see Jesus more clearly? And then finally, joy. And Luke, meals are often associated with joy. For example, in the prodigal son with the party. Presumably here, the disciples are full of joy and wonder after their meal with Jesus, as they race back to Jerusalem and relay their news of what had happened on the way, on their journey with the three-mile-an-hour God, and how they, as well as the kitchen maid possibly, recognised him over the meal. So I hope that those themes might be of some help to you as you reflect on your journey into this new and unknown and uncertain future, how you can practice kindness and gentleness, as I've said, as well as attentiveness. There will perhaps be suffering and woundedness. There will be opportunities to engage in hospitality. There will be opportunities to wonder who is seeing Jesus and exactly where is Jesus. And I hope that there will be moments of great joy. I have got some questions this time if you want to use these for discussion. Let me just run through them. What is the focus of our hopes when we think about Jesus? What kind of Messiah do we portray, reflect in our ministry? How important is attentive listening in our ministry? The speed of love is three miles an hour. What implications does this have for our discipleship, both personally and within our community? And perhaps what implications might that have for our new journey into what the diocese might look like? Suffering and wounds. How are we able to incorporate these into our lives and how do we help others to do so also? What is the role and place of hospitality in our ministry and who are the people in our communities? who can help us to see Jesus. So um, I wish you well as you reflect on the Emmaus Road around your tables.